Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dossi and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page. That's Switch, the number four, and then Good. And then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group, and tell us what you want. Hello, and welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm Alexandra Paul, and hello, Dotsie. It's my hello, one- Alexandra. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you know what I wanted to start off the show with? It's especially um, relevant because we have a doctor on today who's going to talk more about these kind of things, about how people can make changes and stick to them. But as a health coach, that's one of the things that I mainly know how to do is to help people change, but also stick to that change because that's the hard, hard part. So it's now a couple months into the new year and i know a lot of our audience has lost maybe a little motivation on the resolutions that everybody made for 2021 so i just want to talk a little bit before our, we interview dr scott stoll about some tips that might help you get motivated again so don't give up if you slipped okay because just try these suggestions to get back on track and let us know if any of them help so first of all <laughs> Be really specific about what you want. A lot of folks, when they make a resolution, they'll say, I, I want to lose weight. I want to exercise more. But you need to put a number on that. So I want to say, do you want to lose 10 pounds, 20 pounds? If you want to exercise more, I want to be specific. You need to be specific about what you mean by that. Does it mean three times a week for 30 minutes? Or does it mean, um, you know, I want to add more weightlifting into my program by uh, weightlifting for an hour on the weekend. Okay, so you need to be specific about your goal. Then, and we talk about this with Dr. Stoll, be clear about why you want to achieve this goal, the real why, okay, because a lot of times we don't go deep enough into why we want this uh, resolution to happen. So for example, people, and I'll go back to weight, Dotsie, because I work with so many clients who want to lose weight and probably a lot of our audience um, made resolutions in that area too. If you want to lose 20 pounds, you might think, right, well, I just want to look better. Mm -hmm. But I want you to go deeper. And they call this the five whys, but ask yourself, why do you want to look better? So why do I want to look better? Well, to feel better about myself. Go deeper again. Why do I want to feel better about myself? Well, because I want to get this load off my shoulders of guilt and shame and have more energy. Why do I want to have more energy? So I can do fun things with my friends. Go even deeper. Why do I want to do fun things with my friends? I want to have a human connection. So we went from, I want to look good to, I want to have a human connection. And wow. That's more motivating than, I just want to look good. Okay, so you'll really find the core of what you want, uh, why you want to achieve this goal, and it'll be so much more motivating as you go through the months. Um, because, as Dr. Stoll also tells us, habit change takes time, and so you need to be sticking with consistent behaviors over a long period of time. It won't just happen in uh, a week or a month. So now you are specific about what you want and you know why you want it. Now, how do you achieve it? Mm -hmm. oh, there's so many different ways, but let me just give you some really important tips. Firstly, do not overwhelm yourself. Take baby steps. One of the, and Dotsie, I know we've talked about this. One of the two biggest reasons that we fail at our resolu resolutions is that we bite off more than we can handle right away. So start off really small. I know we Americans, we don't like to do that. We like to do big things all at once. 
but you need to gradually build up so that you can get into the habit because this is all about habits. For example, if you uh, have this resolution that you want to run three times a week for 30 minutes and maybe lift weights on Saturdays, do you do that the first week? No, no, do not do that. Start with just maybe two times a week of running for just 15 minutes and then go up slowly because believe me, if you if you take your resolution and just plunk it into week one, you're going to either be so injured, um, you're going to burn out, or you won't be able to fit it into your life. And we're all so busy that when we make these resolutions, they need to fit into your life. And every week we'll learn more and more about how we can better fit this new habit into our life. So don't be one of those people who works a weekend warrior who, uh, you know, works out for two hours and then can't work out for another eight days because that is not going to put you into the habit. Now, the second biggest reason that folks fail at their resolutions is because they do not plan and you have to plan ahead if you start a new habit. You cannot just rely on spontaneity because you have these neural pathways in your, in your brain that are so used to the old way that if you leave it to, to the last minute and, how, and spontaneity, you will not choose to do the new habit. Your brain will basically coax you back into your old ways because you haven't set new pathways. They're strong. And most habits take a little bit. They're not, the reason we want to change is because um, we want to get out of something that's not so healthy into something that might be a little more challenging to do. So we have to plan. And that means scheduling workouts, making sure you have food in your refrigerator before um, before the day that you're going to eat healthy and make sure it's healthy food um, and make it as easy as possible to implement these new little steps by having the food right there visually. And tip, this is a super tip, Take your, get rid of all your unhealthy food. That's sort of self-evident. But if you live with somebody else and you know that there's like maybe something that they really want that you're going to leave in the house, put it somewhere where you can't see it either really high up or really low down, you'd be really amazed how if you if you don't see that chocolate bar, how you are much, 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 much less apt to take it, to eat it um, if it's not in plain view. Um, so please plan ahead for your workouts, for your sleep, um, write it and schedule it in your book. Um, Dotsie, do you have any questions? And I just have a couple. Wow. No, your check's in the mail, though, because that really helped me on a few different levels, so thank you. <laughs> the other one thing is, well, a lot of times when we have resolutions, we're very, as Americans, we're very self-flagellating. We say, I'm not going to eat this anymore. That's our, that's our resolution. That is not, um, that, the brain doesn't like that and the body doesn't like that. So when you change a habit, it's better to phrase it in a positive way. So for example, I have a client who was, um, a soda addict. So instead of saying no more soda, what we, how we phrase it is, when I want soda, I will have sparkling water instead. Now, doesn't that sound a little more like motivating than I'm not having soda? Yeah, absolutely. Because it still gives you whatever that reward or fulfillment you're, you're, you're searching for. It might do the trick. Exactly. Yeah. And he really liked the bubbles from his soda. So we just gave him healthier bubbles. And, and that way you don't have to go straight to, um, just plain old water. You might want to add a little sweetness to your water and then eventually take out the sweetness. So make sure to do baby steps, but don't deprive yourself completely. Find substitutions that are healthier and slowly, uh, wean yourself to healthier and healthier things. Um, so important. So I know when I was coming out of my eating disorder, I sat down with my therapist and I said, when we get to the end of this therapy, I just don't want there to be any food, period, on planet Earth that I am, quote, not allowed to have to, for myself, that I'm not allowing myself to have. And that is really that, that true freedom, right, that you're, that you're looking for. But, but, you, but you have to work hard at the process and the journey because you don't want to have 12 sodas a day. If that happens to be your thing, right? You've got to you've got to figure out how to wiggle through, and then maybe later he can have a half a soda and and feel fine every once in a while. I have a diet coke every time I go to the movies, which is, hasn't been in, once in the last year, but we go like five times a year. And I used to have you know twenty diet cokes a day, 
so that, that now is like, and, and, but because I went through that journey, did the sparkling water is like, I'm not addicted anymore. So I have five Diet Cokes a year and I figure I'm not going to die of Diet Coke if, if I have five a year, it's going to be okay. Right. And Dotsie, you're one of the healthiest eaters I know. So that's really valuable advice is not to make any food bad and completely off limits. Um, unless you discover on your own that your life is better without even e ever eating it again, mm. that would be a decision that you make and not a rule. And so okay. naturally what will happen is that, um, like every so often he'll have a soda. I'll see it in his food journal, but, um, it doesn't come. It's not an addiction anymore. Yeah. It comes one, we catch it really quickly and get right back on the horse. But we, we should really go to our guest because he has so many important um, tips to give us about how we can um, you know, change our habits and stick to them along with other many, many other things. I am especially excited about our guest today. We have a doctor in the house and we know from our download statistics that y'all love you some docs. So we are really honored to welcome Dr. Scott Stoll. Uh, he is the Chief Medical Officer at HealthCentric, co-founder of the Plantrition Project, an author and member of the Whole Foods Medical and Scientific Advisory Board. His expertise has made an impact on thousands, if not millions of lives through the countless boards and companies that he's consulted on. I first got to meet Scott at a Plantrition Project Immersion Weekend in San Diego a few years ago when I was on a panel. He is exceptionally warm, sharp, engaging, and fun fact, he's an Olympian too. <laughs> he was on the 1994 Olympic bobsled team, and he has also served as a nutrition and uh, medical advisor for Team USA and their bobsled team, uh, I think ever since, so we're going to get to chat some about that. But beyond all of this, Dr. Stoll has six kids and he and some grandchildren. <laughs> And he and his wife homeschooled them even before this like distance learning thing was a thing. It must be the plant-based diet everyone is on that gave you gave you all of that energy to, to homeschool all those kiddos. And we're going to talk about that. Welcome, welcome to the show, Dr. Stoll. Uh, thank you, Dotsie. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And thank you, Alexandra. It's such an honor to be with both of you. And uh, I've looked forward to this for a long time. So I know we're going to have a really fun and engaging conversation. And I hope that the audience can take away some really meaningful, um, you know, uh, some meaningful uh, ideas and applications that will help them in life too. No doubt it has. It's been a long, a long time coming to get you on the show from all of our schedules, but it feels like this is just the perfect time. So yeah. I want to start right after you finished medical school. Uh, from, from what we can tell from our research, your wife came to you shortly thereafter, and she suggested that maybe you guys might go plant-based, and you, the athlete that you are, said, I don't know about that. Where am I going to get my protein? And you didn't make the switch, but you had many years into your practice, uh, seven or so years, uh, and you started researching better ways to help your patients. You know, imagine that, not just what you learned in medical school, but the real practice of, uh, of medicine and health and nutrition and how nutrition can affect our health. And you started reading a variety of books. I think you also read Atkins and you started really analyzing um, nutritional education and that really more plants equals less, the di less disease. And your family uh, made the switch around 2004. Do I have most of that correct? That is an excellent summary. Why wow, you want to type that up and send that to me? That's okay. great. We can add it to your bio. No problem. <laughs> I'm on it. So it's, it's, that journey, what I love that your wife was like, hey, and you're like, no, thank you. Um, <laughs> and then you came around from your research. First of all, what were, what were some of the sparks in the research and the books that you were reading that you, you realized, yes, more plants starts to equal less disease in people? Yeah, no, and uh, just to highlight, you know, my wife was way ahead of me back then, and she's still ahead of me, but I've learned now after almost 26 years of marriage to listen to her right away and uh, and pay attention because she was right on. Good man. Um, you know, and uh, I, uh, 
when I was practicing, you know, early in my practice, I just kept hearing my patients tell me they were falling apart. And, you know, in medical school and in residency, you know, we learned about these diseases. We learned about the molecular, uh, at the molecular level, what was happening, how the medications worked. But nobody ever told us where diseases came from. Mm -hmm. And nobody ever gave us any concept or idea that a disease could be suspended or even reversed. So I had the paradigm and kind of the assumption that all of these diseases that I was seeing in my patients, high blood pressure, hypertension, type two diabetes, irritable bowel, et cetera, were just you know, the, a bad deal of cards in your life. It was maybe you know, the consequence of smoking or something like that. Um, and that it was the inevitable consequence of aging. And the only thing that we could do was to manage with medications and try to mitigate side effects and, and mitigate the long-term complications of having these diseases. And so when I started to hear my patients tell me they were falling apart, my first thought was, this is what I expect as a doctor. I will do kind of what I'm supposed to do, which is uh, write a prescription, do a procedure, order a test, refer them to a specialist. Um, but you know, after a couple of years and then hearing this at my you know, in-laws and uh, family get-togethers and neighborhood get-togethers, there was a patient sitting on my exam table one day and she just said to me, Dr. Stoll, can't you help me? I'm falling apart, you know, just a chuckle. And I, uh, I just stopped her for a minute and it was just a question that came into my mind. And I asked her, I said, well, what does falling apart actually mean to you? And, you know, like most good doctors, I'm kind of anticipating what she's going to say. And I'm looking at her past medical history list, trying to figure out which one is causing the most problems or maybe it's side effect from medications. And she stopped me in my tracks when she said, my marriage is falling apart because my husband is just tired of taking care of me. Uh, I can't travel to see my grandchildren. Um, I, you know, I don't go to church or any social activities because I can't, you know, reliably sit for more than an hour. I don't have any friends anymore and I'm depressed. And then with tears coming down her cheeks, she said to me, can you help me, Dr. Stoll? And, you know, in that moment, um, I felt, I felt, Help, I could helpless and hopeless. I didn't know how to help this woman. And I suddenly realized that everything on her past medical history list, all these diseases that I learned about in medical school and residency and understood how to manage were really undermining those most significant parts of our lives. You know, it's relationships, it's hope and vision, it's opportunity to pursue dreams, it's connection with grandchildren, it's service. And uh, I realized in that moment too that I had no idea if I could actually help her. So I walked out of the room and I challenged myself like a good athlete would and said, uh, you know, is there anything that I can do to help her reverse her diseases when she comes back? And that just set me on that learning journey that you described so well. I read, you know, all the diet books because I thought surely one of these smart doctors has the solution <laughs> from Atkins to zone and everything in between South Beach to sugar diet. Um, and found out there's a lot of crazy diets out there, uh, like the tapeworm diet. But, you know, all of them focus <laughs> on weight loss. And <laughs> yeah, all of them focus on weight loss, but none of them focus on really reversing disease and restoring quality of life. And uh, so ultimately, and to shorten the story, I just went back to my roots in nutrition. I was a nutritional science major and undergraduate and started looking at the research and discovered more plants, healthier body. And then found my way, like so many of us did, to T. Colin Campbell's book, um, mm -hmm. The China Study, and then shortly thereafter to uh, Joel Furman, Eat to Live. And we first started at home, changed our diet at home and saw amazing transformation in our children. And then I started using my prescription pad to write breakfast, lunch, and dinner for my patients. And their lives were transformed and my was, mine was transformed forever. Mm. Tell us about how your children were transformed. I'm surprised to hear that. I thought you'd say, you know, your wife was lost weight or whatever, but you're t telling us your children were transformed. Yeah, that's one of the places where we first noticed the difference. You know, um, my I had uh, three children at that time. They were all young and they were you know, kind of facing some of the same problems that most children have, ear infections, colds, sore throats. One of my children had little black circles under his eyes. And, you know, at that time, we thought we were eating healthy. We were doing raw dairy meat, kind of that, uh, you know, uh, Atkins or Weston Price type diet. And, you know, almost within a week, 
of getting rid of all the dairy, um, going to a whole food, 100% whole food plant-based diet, the black circles disappeared, the congestion resolved. And within six months, we noticed that our children just didn't get sick anymore. And now, you know, my oldest son is 23. And from that point on, none of them have had to take antibiotics. Other than seeing myself as a doctor, they've never had to see a doctor except for a well visit check. Um, they've never had strep throat. Uh, they're vibrantly healthy, strong, and have had no um, medical issues. And so, you know, that was one of the big immediate changes that we saw. You have done so much work, as I mentioned, founding the Plantation Project. You also started the International Journal of um, Disease Reversal and Prevention. Uh, I'm wondering where we are in the state of awareness of the traditional medical structure starting to put some nutrition into medical schools. I'm sure this is a question that almost comes up for you daily that people ask. Is the medical professional professionals um, and profession itself, are they, getting the, are they getting the message? Are they going to get the message? Are we gonna start seeing this come out of um, traditional uh, doctors and physicians? Uh, you know, it's really in its infancy right now, Dotsie. Um, the good news is that it's changed a lot in the last five to seven years. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the, the statistics are that, you know, on average, uh, medical school students get about 20 hours of nutritional education in their entire four years of medical school. And most of that is really just nutrition for intensive care unit, for people that are ill, people with diabetes. And so it's, it has actually nothing to do with the nutrition, nutritional science of how to be healthy and how to reverse disease. So almost every doctor that comes out of their educational process, be it you know, in uh, medical school or residency, exits with very little knowledge about nutrition. But unfortunately, you know, doctors, we like to think that we know and understand nutrition. And so there's a lot of nutritional information that's dispensed in doctors' offices on a regular basis based upon their own opinion, but not based upon the science. And so it leads to this real confusion for patients. And statistically, at least 80% of patients want their doctors to talk to them about nutrition. Mm -hmm. So people you know, are looking for this information. Doctors are not qualified because of their educational background to actually give patients the information that sets them free. And one other thing that I've seen is that you know, because we as uh, doctors and clinicians don't understand nutrition, uh, we don't believe that our patients will actually make a change or that it will make a big difference. And so even when we're dispensing information, we're giving them advice, we're giving it with a, um, a belief system that it's not going to make a big difference. And I don't believe that you can actually do that. And I think that's really a critical point because, um, you know, in a way, doctors are salespeople. You know, we're salesmen or saleswomen based upon the information we're, we're giving to people. We're, every day we're selling surgeries and, you know, in 10 minute visit, we convince somebody to, you know, place their body in our care and undergo a scalpel and a six week recovery. It's amazing. So we're selling information on a daily basis. And so we can also, um, you know, we can detract people from engaging in something if we're giving them a message um, in kind of our non-communicative um, language that we don't believe this is really going to help and it's not worth their time and effort. So, but on the good side of this, there have been a lot of significant changes. You know, we're seeing all across America and in, in other countries, student groups taking this issue and forming lifestyle medicine groups, whole food plant-based nutrition groups on campus and taking education into their own hands. That, you know, medical education is is funded by so many pharmaceutical companies and it's driven down that kind of allopathic pharmaceutical intervention with uh, mm -hmm. medical devices. But the students are recognizing this is important and they're inviting people like Dr. Michael Clapper and others onto the campuses to begin educating students. There are also medical schools like the University of South Carolina, uh, Greenville that has a, an entire curriculum woven into the four years of medical school, which is really exciting. And then there are others that are taking Dr. Michael Greger's book, How Not to Die, and using that as a textbook in their medical schools. So I think for the first time, maybe in the, in the, you know, the lifetime of allopathic education, we're seeing some really positive changes. It's still in its infancy, but there's a lot of hope that things are changing. And we can see that 
we can start to make that connection. And, and I, I do feel like the doctors, um, so many of them, uh, they, they really have not ever seen their patients stick to something that they told them to, even continuing to take the medication that they told them to take. And my husband has hypercholesterolemia, and this is a long time ago when he was working through that. And he said, well, is there anything nutritionally I can do? And his doctor said, well, you could go vegan, but nobody ever sticks with that. And he said, well, you don't mm -hmm. really know me that well. So that helped immensely, but it, you could just tell that, you know, that, that doctor was, um, it, you know, he, he, was, his, his, he was out of steam with you know, people not sticking to, uh, but with the, this dawn of new education with the much younger crowd in, in, on college campuses and medical schools, they're the ones that are gonna step up. I really have a lot of hope in that, that millennial generation. You know, they, um, sometimes we kind of push them out or ignore them, but that generation is the future of healthcare and they have a, a kind of a holistic view of healthcare that we don't have in our generation. They're looking at healthcare, you know, uh, from a nutritional standpoint and lifestyle, but they're also understanding that healthcare is a part of a, a global ecosystem that involves, you know, the production of food. Uh, it involves, you know, um, finances for local communities and individuals. And so they are starting to look at this and say, you know, we've got to make some changes. And they're driving more change maybe than, than our generation, which is really exciting. I want to go back to what Dotsie and you both touched on, which is the, uh, the, the, the difficulty of change, of uh, people changing. Uh, you, uh, Scott, have really worked hard to, to, with your immersions and all the, or your books is to help people change. What, when a patient comes into your room, into your, into your office and says, I need help and I want to change and you prescribe a plant-based diet, how do you tell them to implement it so that it's the most successful? Um, or if, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess let's start with you as a doctor in the, in, the, in the room and then maybe extrapolate out to your immersions and how you ensure that when they go home that they continue this, these great habits. Yeah, that is a great question. That's where the rubber meets the road. You know, we can talk all day about science, which is really fun and exciting. But it's really the translation of whatever that science is into daily habits that makes a difference. And so, um, you know what, I like to, I've learned through the years that, you know, information doesn't necessarily change people, it's important. Um, but one of the most important things that I've always tried to do for my patients is inspire hope. I find that most people that come into my clinics are hopeless. Medicine in general is, is it doesn't offer a lot of hope. You know, uh, doctors, you know, we're, we're, um, we're, we're very good at bringing bad news and telling people, you know, this is the worst case I've ever seen. I don't know that if this is going to change. You're going to have to take multiple medications. So I've always tried to flip that and give people hope. And the science of hope is very interesting that when somebody grabs a hold of it and actually has hope, it activates multiple centers in their brain, especially the frontal part of the brain where they begin organizing and laying out a plan for the future. So when somebody is inspired with hope, they automatically begin planning how they're going to reach that new vision. So I'll do things in my clinic, like tell stories. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, through my past patients, I'll think of a story that is uh, of a patient that is very similar to their situation or one that I believe would inspire them. And I'll just tell a story to try and just capture their imagination and give them a vision for something that they might not think was possible. So that's the first thing I do is try to inspire hope. The second thing I do is I try to let them know that I'm gonna support them and they're a part of a community because I found that change doesn't happen um, in a vacuum and it's very difficult to make a change as an individual. It's also difficult to make a change if you're the only one in your household that's making that change. And so people really know, need to know that they're going to be supported, that there's a place where they can find not just resources and information, but a listening ear and encouraging words and um, the ongoing support that they'll need. So I really try to connect them in with the staff, with my, uh, my office and with myself and let them know that, you know, if I need to see you in a week or two weeks to help you, that I'll be here. If you have questions, give me a call. So I, that's the second piece is the community and the support. The third thing I try to do is 
um, I try to find something that is really meaningful to them. You know, I, if, for instance, if I was trying to encourage, you know, um, uh, a teenager to make a lifestyle change, I wouldn't talk about heart disease, type 2 diabetes, uh, or cancer, because they just don't care about those things. You know, if I, if I noticed that uh, one of them was struggling with acne, I would start with acne and begin kind of laying out the science of um, plant-based nutrition and acne, or if it was an athlete, I would start talking about performance. So I would really try to um, find that, that um, you know, that motivating piece of their life that would really help them to engage and want to learn more. And so I'll, I'll take the time to really, you know, find out something that's meaningful and answer the why and then connect it back to plants. Um, and the other thing I try to do is um, try to remove like guilt and shame in the past because so many people come in mm. and uh, especially as adults, they have a lot of guilt and shame they carry from past diets. Mm. And so I just try to help them understand that, you know, this is all of that is erased. We're not expecting perfection. We're going to just work through this together. In fact, as you make change uh, and Dotsie knows this well as an athlete, you can expect failure along the way and it's totally okay. It's a part of the process. And so I, I set a reasonable expectation that it's not perfection, but it's a, a process of going through change. And, you know, if you decide to, uh, you know, have a huge banana split one night because you're stressed, it doesn't, you know, ruin everything. It's okay. We'll just start the next day, the next bite, the next meal and get back on track. So I really try to set this kind of uh, picture to let them know um, and to set the reasonable expectations for change. Um, and then I just really, I, you know, I'll help lay out. And I've learned through the years that uh, sustainable change begins with the formation of just small, tiny habits. Um, and there are some people that are ready, you know, uh, uh, like a personality like Dotsie or yourself, where you say, just let me go all in right now. I'm going to, you know, clean out my entire house and make the change. And there are others that want to just step in gently. So I try to give an assessment. And if somebody wants to go gently, I'll figure out what we can do, you know, the one small change that we can make in the next two weeks before I see them and ask them to do that consistently. And then they'll gain that level of success by, you know, adding one smoothie a day or one salad a day. When they come back, they'll be excited and ready to add the next step. So those are just a few of the things that, uh, that we work on, but thank you. That was an excellent question. Well, that was an excellent answer too. And um, I could relate to so many of them so as a health coach and, and um, I help people change and you're just, I want you to be my doctor. Um, I also want to just mention that, that what you said about hitting people, what's important to them is when I, the, one of the reasons I never smoked as a kid was because when I was in sixth grade, Laura Van Doren, who was in high school, came and talked to uh, my sixth grade class and said that the reason she quit smoking was because um, her boyfriend said that her, her mouth tasted like an ashtray and I was in sixth grade and I wanted boys to like kissing me. And that was, that was so much more powerful than all those nurses that stood up and showed a picture of a, a clean lung versus a dirty lung. That is great. Yeah, that's the meaningful uh, point of change for you, right? That's, I think, you know, as in medicine and healthcare and health coaching, we need to take time to listen more than we talk and find those things that are really important to the person and meet them where they're at and use those as key motivators. They leverage change far more than, you know, what we think to be important. And we back up the dump truck and start delivering information. They get overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah. You're so right. It's such a, an incredible point that you both make. Uh, so you wrote the book Alive, uh, A Physician's Biblical and Scientific Guide to Nutrition. You don't see those two words in the same sentence even together very often, much less in a book title. I think Alexandra and I both feel like houses of worships, churches, um, a very powerful place to inspire change. Would you give us uh, a bit of a tutorial on the parts of uh, the, the Christian Bible and, and other passages of the Torah, the Quran, or wherever you choose, Hindu, Buddhist teachings, that uh, best support a plant-based diet, best support maybe not eating animals for, for, for whatever the reason might be? Yeah, you know, it's very interesting when we look, you know, um, historically, and we look at a number of um, religious faiths around the world, that, you know, for most of human history, 
um, many of the religious groups, be it Judaism, uh, Islam, were um, mostly plant-based. Buddhism, you know, they've been predominantly plant-based. They've been predominantly vegetarian throughout most of human history. Mm. It's really with the advent of the 20th century and, you know, animal production that many of them have shifted in this direction of being, you know, westernized in their, in their diets. And so we see in you know, Islam, and I'm working, doing a lot of work in the Middle East, um, both in Saudi Arabia and Dubai, they have very animal heavy diets now, highly processed food. And I was just in Riyadh last year and I was surprised, you know, there's Chuck E. Cheese pizza, Wendy's, yeah. McDonald's on every corner. And so their diet has been very westernized. Um, and the same, you know, even in, we're doing work in Thailand and in the East, and, you know, they've taken on the westernized diet, moving away from traditional plant-based diets and curry and, you know, all these amazing foods into this westernized pattern. Uh, the same has happened in the, in the modern Christian church. You know, the, the research shows that the, the modern Christian church is the most unhealthy religion with, and religious group in the United States. Um, they have heavier weights, higher blood pressure, higher cholesterol mm -hmm. than all the other uh, religious groups in America. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, I really believe that um, churches and religious groups can serve as a very potent opportunity to affect change in community. And if, uh, you know, a number of the groups would kind of just reclaim even the past where they, they came from as a foundation, I believe that we would see um, radical transformations in diets uh, very, very quickly. Uh, we, we learned from the Seventh-day Adventists who have that history of utilizing a plant-based diet and looking at the Adventist studies that, you know, that kind of integration of a healthy lifestyle into the fabric of belief systems can have profound effect on generations. And that's what we learned from the Adventist health studies, that they have much lower rates of heart disease, breast cancer, and all cancers, uh, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, because it's been woven in. And it makes a lot of sense, you know, um, no matter which uh, religious group you're a part of, that, you know, recognizing the innate um, complexity and value of each individual. Um, and like in the, the Christian faith, believing that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, um, that, you know, that we are, we have like a sacred responsibility to take care of ourselves. And rather than just, you know, being consumers and eating what pleases us, um, you know, there's that recognition that I have to take care of myself because in taking care of myself, I'm actually taking care of others and I'm taking care of my community. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the religious um, beliefs move us beyond kind of this individualism that has crept into Western society and move us back into the sense of community and responsibility that we all have for each other. Uh, and we see this when someone's unhealthy. We all know that, you know, it doesn't just impact me if I'm unhealthy. All of my children's lives are impacted. My spouse is impacted. The places where I'm volunteering or serving are dramatically impacted. We all know in, uh, from the experience in work, if somebody is ill, um, we have to carry the extra load. And so one person's sickness impacts a community. And when we're talking about tens of millions and billions of people, two billion people that are overweight or obese in the world, we have a global community that is, that is being impacted. And so, you know, my encouragement with the book for the Christian churches and, you know, when I'm working with my friends that are, um, you know, uh, Buddhists or um, in Islam is, you know, that this needs to be reintegrated into the fabric just for the health of the community, if nothing else. So it's not so much that the Bible um, preaches that we shouldn't kill animals. It's more that overall tenet of uh, a, a healthy community. Yeah, and what's interesting, you know, uh, in Genesis 129, the, um, it talks about the original provision of food was plants. It was trees and plants. That was the original provision. And so I'm always thinking, well, if that was the best, if that was what was originally provided, that makes sense to go back to the best and not uh, to mm -hmm. what we have in between. My friend, the Reverend Peter Kreitler is an environmentalist and he went to, uh, I think, University of Virginia Ser Seminary. And he, um, has, he educates young seminarians about the environment so that they can go out into their churches and, and weave into their sermons on Sundays this message 
of uh, taking care of the earth because I think the first page of the Old Testament says something about um, the taking care of the, the the dominion and is that right, Scott? Yeah, that's right. You know, that's the stewardship. I love to talk about stewardship, um, and I, you know, it's such an important principle. Uh, and it's whether it's you know coming through the the lens of of just um, uh, religious faith or just recognizing the fact that all of us are just passing through this life, you know, living hopefully a hundred plus years on this earth. You know, we're we're all um, I think we all have a responsibility of stewarding what's been given to us for the next generation. And that's you're exactly right. In uh, Genesis, it talks about that idea that. You know, um, God gave um, humankind the responsibility for caring for the creation. Uh, and it's not exploitation. It's the idea that we are doing, you know, managing something in such a way that it's better for the next generation. Managing resources in such a way that there's more abundance for the next generation. Um, but, you know, westernized thought has, you know, it's again, it's, that um, instant gratification and exploitation of resources for self. And we see the impact of that in the environment. We see the impact in human health. We see the impact in relationships and family. You know, it's, we don't have to look too far to see that that's one of the, the core issues is this, um, you know, the service of self and not the recognition of stewardship for the benefit of the next generation. And, you know, I, I think we also find that when we're working as stewards, our lives are much happier. The more we focus on serving self, the more we realize that we're still empty after getting all these things and we keep craving more. But the more that we give and the more that we serve, the more that we're fulfilled. And it creates this uh, this constant flow back out into society. On the Plantrition uh, website, which people need to go visit if they haven't, uh, it, it says that only about 12% of Americans' diet is whole food plant-based, that over uh, 60% is processed and about a quarter, quarter is uh, directly from animal-based foods. And you recommend a whole food plant-based diet to recover from COVID. So I didn't say not to get COVID, but to recover from COVID. And we, we haven't had a doctor on talking about the recovery because, well, we have, um, you know, 500,000 Americans, right? Um, who, almost 500,000 Americans who have lost their lives and uh, many millions who are recovered or recovering. How can this best support uh, this uh, very challenging recovery from this virus? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And, you know, um, I think one of the, the exciting things for me is that every time, you know, you dig a little bit deeper, you find something else that further supports the position of whole food plant based. And this is one of them, you know, looking at COVID. Um, one of my good friends and a board member of the Plantrition Project is Dr. William Lee, who has studied extensively angiogenesis. And over the past year, he's actually become one of the, the global experts on COVID and this kind of long COVID syndrome that yeah. they call the, the recovery after COVID. And what's so interesting about the, the virus is that it actually attacks the inner lining of the blood vessels. That inner lining is called the endothelium. It's a one layer thick cellular layer that, that spans the 60,000 miles of blood vessels in our body. And so this virus is, a, is different than many others because it actually just chews it up and it creates this in, intense inflammatory reaction inside the blood vessels of the entire body, including the lungs. And this is one of the reasons that the lungs develop fluid is because of the injury to the blood vessels um, in those tiny little blood vessels at the, the bottom of the lungs. Um, so what's exciting about that though is that his research in angiogenesis um, through the years has demonstrated that it's plants that optimize the health of the blood vessel layer and promote recovery. Um, they did extensive research looking at, you know, all of the foods that would optimize the health of the blood vessels that would restore the endothelium. And it's everything that you and I um, and Alexandra eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. It's dark leafy greens, it's all the berries, it's spices like turmeric and ginger, it's uh, herbs and garlic and uh, cinnamon. It's, it's this wonderful array of all these nutrient-dense foods that are filled with polyphenols and phytochemicals that restore this, this lining. Mm -hmm. And for many other reasons, you know, plant-based nutrition 
impacts the, the genes, it restores the cells, it reduces inflammation. We know that with COVID, there's this intense inflammatory reaction um, following infection and that can be prolonged you know, post-infection. But we know that um, the, the whole food plant-based diet flips off these master switches of inflammation in the body with every single bite. Within two to four hours, it's turning off inflammation. Uh, and so, you know, the mm. best recovery after COVID is a, a really nutrient rich diet, seven to eight hours of sleep, some good water, you know, exercising as much as you can without overstressing the body and then working on stress, obviously. But I really believe that we're going to see some incredible research in the next year about mm -hmm. the power of that lifestyle intervention for overcoming long COVID syndrome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's a great explanation. Yeah. Um, you're a member of the Google Food Lab. What is that, and, and what is the Google Food Lab doing? So, you know, I was invited to be a part of the Google, Google Food Lab, which was uh, a conversation um, amongst, you know, experts around the country in different areas of the food ecosystem to try and identify um, solutions to the, the challenges that we have in food. And so they, they did conversation through interviews um, and then they had a live conversation in California. Um, I have not seen the follow-up. They were gonna take all of this data and gather it and then work to develop solutions. And I have not seen the solutions that have come out of that yet. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, to hopefully, you know, this is where data can help deliver some, some real life solutions and target some places where we can begin making changes. What was the, when you say solutions, what were the problems that y'all were putting forth? Was it scarcity of food around the world or was it obesity, uh, disease? You know, it's this multifactorial uh, challenge that we have with the food ecosystem, you know, going all the way back to the way that we grow food, um, you know, and looking at things like soil erosion, the use of pesticides and herbicides, um, the impact to the uh, ecosystem and the way that we're, you know, producing food, uh, the supply chain, and, you know, that also takes into account access problems for so many people in inner cities and, and these food deserts. Um, we looked at cost challenges, you know, to actually afford good food, um, because, as you all know, that the, you know, the government subsidizes um, really a food system to produce food for animals. And so, you know, we don't have inexpensive um, healthy food, we have inexpensive unhealthy food. And so it drives people into this place of eating unhealthy food just because of cost. You know, we looked at, um, you know, uh, physician and uh, healthcare providers knowledge of product providing food solutions and then the resources that are available within the healthcare system to actually deploy those solutions for patients in a meaningful way. Uh, health coaches and health coach availability, um, which is really important. You know, the more that I've been in this um, business, I've really come to believe that people need health coaches and they need them for more than just a few months. Uh, most people need a really good health coach for a year, two years to be able to make that transition and make it sustainable. Um, and then all the way up to like, you know, government policy um, impact that needs to occur. So it's, you know, the, the global food system is one of the most important um, pillars in our entire society, but it's one that we don't talk about that often and it's very compartmentalized and it's driven by profit. So that kind of gives you a little bit of the overview. You, you sh shared a, a, a really powerful story at the beginning about the about the woman that was kind of the impetus to your going down the rabbit hole of, uh, you know, really understanding and teaching uh, the hopeful connection between food and health and, 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 and food and the human body. I, I worked with a woman um, who was the executive vice president uh, at Midland Health, uh, and her name is Marcy Madrid. She's actually currently the vice president of... Um, uh, of community health and population health. Mm -hmm. And I met her in 2015 and she had just been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And, you know, the diagnosis was really devastating for her. She was the mother of six, um, an amazing person working in her MBA, uh, leading the hospital, you know, ascending the ranks quickly because of her talent. But, and she had this, you know, initially tingling and numbness in her hands and feet, started to get very fatigued and went to the doctor. 
They ordered an MRI of her brain and her spinal cord, and she had big, intense inflammatory lesions, inflammation in her brain and her spinal mm -hmm. cord. And so like most people, she went to the neurologist, the best neurologist that she could find, and they started her on the drugs for multiple sclerosis and the side effects from the first one, the second one, the third one, and mm -hmm. you know, wasn't able to find a drug without side effects. And she was progressively getting worse. She was telling me that uh, at the end of the day, she would go home and just lay on the couch because she had no energy left, wasn't able to attend her children's games, um, wasn't able to even you know, fully complete her job. And so she was laying there on the couch thinking, what am I going to do? What does my future look like? How am I gonna be a mother to my children? Um, you know, she had so many dreams and visions for her work at the hospital. And so uh, I was invited by um, a cardiothoracic surgeon to do a CME event at the hospital. And um, out of that opportunity to connect with her and um, Marcy learned about plant-based nutrition, she started making some lifestyle changes. And, you know, at that point, it, you have to go all in. You know, there's not small changes to better improvement when you're really sick. I always tell my patients, you have to fight with every bite. Every bite matters. Mm -hmm. And so she did. She, she ate a whole food plant-based diet. She minimized her stress, started working on her sleep. And she improved dramatically in three to four months. All of her symptoms completely resolved. Six months later, she's in Dallas, Texas, seeing one of the, um, the experts in the United States on multiple sclerosis. And they reordered MRIs of her brain and spinal cord. And they found that the lesions in her brain and spinal cord had completely resolved. And she was so excited that she said, um, uh, you know, this is amazing. And the, the doctor was actually more excited because he, he said, I have never seen this in my entire career of taking care of people with multiple sclerosis. And so what was what's so exciting about this story is that it just didn't impact Marcy but the doctor became inspired along with his PA and they started recommending plant-based nutrition to all of their patients because wow. they saw such dramatic changes. And now they're doing research using whole food plant-based nutrition um, in their patients. And so it's one person's change that became multiplied because they connected with a doctor that, um, you know, saw something that he didn't, he had never seen before. That's wonderful that he didn't think, oh, it's just a fluke. It doesn't have to do with the diet. Um, right. it, it was really exciting that he actually grabbed a hold of it and was willing to move forward. And now he's changing so many lives because um, he was willing to be open-minded. Wow. And the plant-based diet was certainly transformative for me as an athlete in those last few years leading into the 2012 games. And um, I know that you have done uh, quite a bit of uh, <clears throat> medical advocacy work, nutrition advocacy work with the bobsled team, with Team USA, the bobsled team. Uh, and those, uh, those, those men and women are, uh, let's just say, uh, quite full of muscles, right? Like they are really demanding. If you can think of, you know, 20 Olympic sports, that would be one in the top three, along with probably weightlifting that I would say they are needing to put on an exorbitant amount of muscles in their, in their hip and their glutes and their thighs to be able to get the sled up to the speed that it needs to go down the ice. So what, what was that journey like for you as, as you started to, um, you know, it, it envelop the idea of, of, of leaning more into plants for anti-inflammation, better recovery. Uh, what kind of pushback did you get as far as, you know, where's the protein, which was your question to your wife right after medical school, uh, after being a bobsledder yourself? And how did, how did those athletes, uh, did, did, did they allow the information to sink in? Did some of them make some changes to their diet? Yeah, that's a great question. And, uh, I, you know, having been an athlete, I think you probably know some of the answers that I'm going to say that, uh, you know, number one, um, working with athletes is a challenge at that level, uh, because, um, you know, they've had to be very competitive along the way. Um, they've been very protective about their sources of information. Um, even, you know, within a sport like bobsledding or I'm sure, sure cycling, you know, you're competing against each other before you get to the Olympics. And so, you know, you're very protective of your information and your um, exercise regime because you want the advantage over your other teammate, even on the U.S. team. Um, and so they have a lot of belief systems and paradigms and, and things that they have 
adhered to very strongly through the years that have gotten them to that place. Uh, and so I learned very quickly that you have to tread gently when you're talking about diet with athletes at that level, because they all have a, a very strong opinion and idea of what works. Um, the other thing I found with athletes that's challenging is because they are incredible physiological specimens, they can get away with um, indiscretions in their diet that most people cannot. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you remember this. I wasn't, I, I thought it was healthy when I was training for the Olympics, but no, when I was at the uh, Olympic Training Center in, in New York, Lake Placid, you know, they had Dove bars and ice cream and mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff available, you know, most of the day and into late night. And, you know, the thought was, you know, I just burned 5,000 calories today. I can have two Dove bars. And you can, you can get away with it. You're still, you know, four or 5% body fat. You're muscled and strong. You go out the next day and, you know, you're pushing huge weight and you're competing and you think that you're getting away with it. Um, and so that's a challenge to overcome that belief system because they don't feel or see the impact. And so, you know, I had to learn to navigate those conversations in, um, in kind of unique ways, um, you know, I've always found that the female athletes are much more willing to hear the information and engage and make changes. And I don't know if you found that too through your years of working with yeah. um, athletes yeah. and talking with athletes. I just find the women know. to be a lot more inquis inquisitive through the, you know, they really want to know the root of where something's coming from and, and, and not just because so-and-so did it. Yeah, it's that's right. It's very true. You know, they'll hold up a men's health magazine and say, I read this article, the men will. <laughs> and the women will ask the right question. So um, I found through the years that, you know, working with the bobsled and skeleton athletes, that it was the women that were much more willing to embrace those changes. But, you know, over time, uh, they had an impact on the men and the men were, you know, more open because they heard the women talking and, you know, they saw that they were recovering a little bit faster, that they didn't have as much delayed onset muscle soreness. And it was the, um, you know, it was really the, the, experience of competing with the women and training with the women that had more of an impact on the men than anything that I presented. And so I, I learned to kind of work through the women, the female athletes to get to the men. Um, and, you know, it's, it can be very challenging too, because you spend so much time really trying to work and craft a, a message and help the athletes. And then, you know, some of the male athletes would come walking through with Snickers bars and say, Hey, Dr. Stoll, I'm eating my protein bars. And they, right. <laughs> they only knew. <laughs> but a couple of the areas where I really found that it can be helpful. You know, I talk about uh, delayed onset muscle soreness and recovery, which as you know, you know, it's at least 50% faster in, um, in plant-based athletes than, than omnivoric athletes. And that's really important because, you know, you can operate at a much higher level in your next workout than your um, teammate or competitor because you just don't have the soreness. So I hit that one. I talk about um, uh, illness prevention because that's something that, um, you know, not many athletes think about. But if you get you know, a severe cold, if you get a GI condition right before a big event, which is not uncommon because of the stress, that can dramatically impact your opportunity to make a World Games or an Olympics. So I'll really talk about that and help them understand, you know, that if you're eating sugar, you're suppressing your immune system for four hours, especially the natural killer cells that are responsible for fighting bacteria and viruses. And if you're having Pop-Tarts at breakfast and you know, a Dove bar at lunch and ice cream at dinner, you've suppressed your immune system the entire day and you're more likely to get sick than your competitors. And so I'll, you know, I'll try to find um, interesting areas to begin a conversation rather than just going back to those, you know, fighting the questions about where am I gonna get my protein? Um, you know, how many calories do I have to eat? I'm not gonna get enough calories. I'm gonna lose weight because vegans are always scrawny. You know, I don't wanna fight those things. I'll start somewhere else and we can get back to those questions once I have buy-in on the power of plants. Mm -hmm. it's so true about just really the fight to not get sick before one of the biggest competitions in your life. Cause you're just, you're so on the edge, right? We call it, you're just right there. And it's, you just tip over it and you're, you're, you're going to get sick. You're gonna be more susceptible to picking up a virus or just the, the, the common cold. And at that level, there's a difference between less than 1% between 
gold and no metal at all. And it, it, just a common cold will, will derail that. So that alone is, uh, I think, a, a, a really good reason to be looking deeply at nutrition and what can really put that power in your body to be able to fight off uh, anything coming in. Because the, your, your whole life of training is, is just a you know, hell in a handbasket if you get a cold the night before the Olympic final. Uh, I, 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 my, my yeah. teammate from 2012 and in 2008, she was one of the best sprinters in the world and, uh, got a cold and got seventh. I mean, you just can't, you just can't quite get to oh. that, 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 that top level. Yeah. 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 And athletes don't think about that. Nobody ever asked that question. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nobody really thinks about immunity, mm -hmm. um, as an athlete. And so that's a, it's always a really good place to start a conversation with athletes because it's something they haven't thought about. And so they don't have a defense, um, you know, against yeah. that. So, and I got it, you know, I remember back in, um, when I was at the world championships in 1990, I'm dating myself now, 1993 okay. before the Olympics, you know, I got a sinus infection and it was miserable bobsledding with a sinus infection, you know, because you have all those G forces. And so it was incredibly yeah. oh. painful. I felt terrible. And so, you know, it's, it does impact you um, in a significant way. Yeah, we got to clean up the, uh, the 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 cafeterias at the training centers. It, you know, they're doing a little bit better, but Dairy's still their main sponsor, so there's still dub bars floating around all over the place. When we used to go to training there, my teammates and I called it fat camp. We say we're going to fat camp because when you're living at home, you, you have control over what's in your house and what you're going to eat. And as chef AJ says, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth and you go to the training. you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's that you could pack on the freshman 15, like you do at school when you go and suddenly there's all this food 24 seven, you can go in and eat how much, however you, and, and you know, and you're a poor athlete. You're, so you're not having to pay for it. And it was, uh, I mean, it was, it was a joke. I thought that's now looking back. It's funny that going to the Olympic training center it was fat camp to us like that's it seems like it, it lines it up it does not yeah. I've seen a few positive changes when I go back now you know they have at least yeah. they have blenders and veggies for smoothies but you know that's over in the corner after you have to go right. buy the omelets and the waffles and the bacon and the sausage <laughs> yeah that is so so true Oh gosh. Well, I wanted to ask a, a question, uh, last question about your uh, seven day immersion program that helps people overcome addictions. Is it just food addictions or is it other addictions that it helps them overcome? You know what I found through the years? That's a really perceptive question that, you know, uh, when we talk about food addictions, it's still the same reward system. It's the dopamine reward system in our brain um, that is impacted by sugar, fat, and salt. And so, uh, you know, when we look at the population, it's like 12 to 15% of the population has a hypersensitized reward system that can be impacted by alcohol, by opioids, by um, cocaine, by cigarettes, by any of the others, by, you know, base jumping, whatever it is, right. it's, the, it's the same reward system. And, um, you know, some people just find their way to food. And what's interesting through the years, I found that a lot of people that have, you know, made a very positive move away from alcohol or tobacco find food as kind of a substitutionary acceptable um, mm -hmm. uh, addiction today. And, you know, it's acceptable because you go to the office store and when you're buying paper for your printer, you have to walk the gauntlet of chocolate just to get your, your paper. So it's, it's much more read re readily available and I think much more challenging. So at our immersions, you know, we always, um, we inform people and kind of warn them in advance that over the next three days, you may experience pretty intense withdrawal symptoms as we remove food, just like you would experience withdrawal from any other drug or alcohol or tobacco. Um, and so they do, they experience the same things, uh, headaches, nausea, vomiting, um, all kinds of, of challenges as they come off of those foods. But we find that, you know, by the end of the week, they're free. And they experience freedom, they feel better, they see the power that food had over them. 
and they, they are able to see the kind of contrast of mm. that food. Um, and they also will recognize, you know, if they're, we've had many people that, you know, are caffeine addicts and come in drinking 20 cups of coffee and they see that benefit. We've had people that, you know, have struggled with drug addictions and tobacco. And by shifting off of unhealthy food onto healthy food, the rich phytochemicals and the, the nutrient density of the healthy plants kind of mitigates um, some of the inflammation in their body, helps to improve their mood, uh, which is an important part of overcoming addiction, and at least gives them the step out um, to start kind of realigning their reward system. And we warn people that, you know, it takes a good three months for your reward system to actually begin resetting itself, and in mm -hmm. some cases, six to nine months. And so during that period of time, you're gaining freedom, you really have to be diligent. If you're in that 12 to 15% where you're hypersensitized to food, where, you know, I've had people tell me that one bite of a candy can send them into kind of a binge cycle again. Mm -hmm. If that's you and you're struggling, then you really do need to be hyper vigilant for a season in life to allow your reward system to reset itself to gain control then over those foods. When we eat uh, those foods or drink alcohol or smoke cigarettes, there's a tolerance that develops over time where those receptors in the brain that would normally be activated by a small amount, um, you know, now it takes, you know, twice as much after a month to get the same feeling. And, you know, unfortunately today, you know, food has become a counselor for so many people that, you know, are struggling with stress and emotional challenges and financial challenges. We go to food because we don't feel good. We eat food and we feel good for a short period of time. And then we don't feel good again. And then we cycle back to food, but we eat the same amount that we did the time before, but we don't get the same effect. And so we increase it. And now we feel good again but then we don't feel good and we start gaining weight and then we take on guilt or shame and it just starts this really negative downward spin for so many people. Um, but by breaking that cycle, at least of the food piece and then recognizing the emotional piece and beginning to deal with that in a healthy way can set people free for the rest of their life. Thank you so much for all, you're just an amazing doctor and purveyor of inf this valuable information throughout the world. Um, so thank you for all that you do to help people make health, uh, be healthier and happier. Hey folks. Okay. Back by very popular demand is our plant powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free. If you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review does not need to be long does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review. And zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future. <laughs>